What's up, Movement Masters? It's Sean Mishka, Movement Mastery and OptimizeMovement.com coming to you with another movement lesson. You know, most of you know by now, and if you don't, it's likely that you're, you're probably going to be able to tell after watching a video or two. And I'm not ashamed to admit it, but I'm pretty obsessed with motor behavior, motor control, and motor learning. And the acquisition of movement skill is something that truly fascinates me and keeps me up on most nights. You know, it's also true that because of this obsession, I'm constantly studying theories that could hold keys to the acquisition and attainment of the most masterful displays of movement for my athletes in their respective sport movement tasks. You know, in one theory of motor learning that has become more popular in recent time has been that idea of the dynamical systems theory. Uh, because of this, we're kind of going to explore that uh, topic, that idea, that concept here today and discuss and chat about what that, con uh, that theory actually consists of, how that concept differs from other more traditional theories in motor learning, and how we can look to apply those ideas of the dynamical systems theory in the context of our existing philosophies as movement practitioners. For starters, anytime you mention dynamical systems theory, it's going to be impossible to not subsequently mention or speak of utilizing a constraints-led approach as well as take on the topic of ecological psychology. Because both of these concepts pretty much serve as the foundational mechanisms through which a dynamical systems theory will be proposed to work through. And the dynamical systems theory and the approaches taken by it have essentially been formulated by numerous popular uh, and legendary movement scientist experts uh, such as Carl Newell uh, as well as as far back as Nikolai Bernstein. You know, and, and it's later been popularized uh, by others such as Keith Davids, uh, Chris Button, and Simon Bennett, who wrote the 2008 uh, book, which essentially popularized the, the idea of the theory, uh, which was centered around the topic and was entitled The Dynamics of Skill Acquisition. You know, so since then, other movement experts, other movement scientists have kind of jumped on board as well, as have practitioners as we've looked to explore the ideas of application of this theory of motor learning. You know, dynamic systems theory is essentially a bit more of an interdisciplinary framework which aims to study the display of movement based on the interaction and coordinative processes that will occur between three things essentially the organism or the athlete, uh, the task, and then the environment. And the implications of each of these three then cannot be looked at independently as the behavior of the organism or the athlete performing the task is entirely dependent on that which what the environment presents. And essentially then, the constraints provided by each of those will determine the coordination and then the control of the movement that we display uh, or that the athlete displays in that movement that we witness. You know, in, in most traditional theories uh, of motor learning will include more information processing theories uh, such as Fitz uh, State Theory or Schmidt's General Motor Program and Schema Theory or others that are typically going to be more predicated on the attainment or acquisition of more idealized motor patterns without truly really ever investigating the organization of movement in response to chaotic environmental changes. However, also traditionally, it could be argued that some of these theories have always neglected to uh, allow for movement authenticity and true virtuosity, so the use of that movement pattern in the ever-changing conditions of sport. You know, so you know, when we don't look at authenticity, this doesn't really allow the athlete uh, to chase or attempt to acquire the most uh, optimal kinematic structure or the motor pattern that's going to be most optimally suit that they're most optimally suited for. So this will usually involve the rehearsal of certain kinematic structures or motor patterns 
that have been attained by uh, a differing level of skill for that respective movement pattern in action. Thus, you guys have heard me talk about that before, so you can probably see why I feel as though anything, any theory or concept that proposes to tackle these all-important uh, aspects that kind of fit within my own personal movement philosophy is definitely worth investigating more fully. So let, to, you know, to take this a little bit further, let me remind you of the problem that Nikolai Bernstein acknowledged and made us aware of way back in 1967, which is known to most as the degrees of freedom problem, which essentially states that the organism or the athlete, the human being, uh, must learn to or how to employ and constrain a large number of degrees of freedom during all types of movement actions based on the countless possibilities that the system actually has to do so in order to solve uh, motor problems and, and, and then be able to carry out uh, that movement based on what the environment gives us. And, you know, because of this, he and later then Carl Newell formulated a model of motor learning which was based off of this idea which essentially took the learner from assembling a coordination pattern to gaining greater control of it to then finally more fully optimizing the skill level of the coordinative pattern. And additionally then, each one of those three stages of that model are going to involve different varying levels of movement variability, uh, respective of where that athlete is at that given moment in time. And this awareness is really what led Bernstein to say that practice should basically be, practice of any movement, should basically be repetition without repetition and not just a simple rehearsal of an idealized motor pattern. In knowing this then, advocates of the dynamic systems, dynamical systems theory essentially go after my own heart as they talk frequently about a few topics uh, that I believe to be true. Uh, you know, the acquisition or attainment and adjustment of a perceptual motor landscape, uh, individuality in movement technical execution, uh, as well as movement strategies, so differing strategies based on who that athlete is and how they sense and perceive uh, things within the environment as well as uh, their own selves in space and time. Uh, the analysis of an athlete's intrinsic dynamics or what I would refer to as the biodynamic structure of movement, uh, movement variability, as well as uh, you know an approach towards nonlinear pedagogy. So basically, when it comes to the actual application of the dynamical systems theory, the movement professional would be attempting to manipulate constraints, either within the environment or of the task, such as maybe what the opponent is doing, or the rules and regulations of the game in some way. And either one of these things or other things like it are essentially being done to allow a more functional movement solution to emerge from these changes in response to the different types of problems that the athlete is going to face within the sport. And essentially the whole theory then revolves around this constant interaction of those types of constraints. Um, and, and those who are diehards with the application and efficacy of this theory, who believe that the organism aka the athlete, will then discover and essentially self-organize a sufficient solution to the problem if they are given the opportunity to do so. And because of this then, the coupling of information and the, the coupling of information with movement rather is going to be key to this uh, kind of unwinding and unfolding. And therefore the movement actions are very rarely separated from that of perception because that perception is going to start any motor action in the context of sport. And this movement behavior and the associated motor pattern will then become part of what they refer to as the athlete's perceptual motor landscape. And this is where the idea of the attractors and the fluctuations of movement kind of come from, uh, a topic and a concept that we've discussed here before. You know, in, in the most practical application of the dynamical systems theory for most practitioners is going to typically come through the use of small-sided games 
or what dynamical system theory advocates will call teaching games for understanding, where the practitioner essentially allows the athlete's behavior to emerge or adapt based on the tactical demands and the understanding of those tactical demands at the same time as they attempt to acquire movement and sports specific skills at the same time. Thus, most practitioners of this theory will essentially separate drills from gameplay very, very little. That all said, I would have to personally say that I believe that the truth for the most optimal motor control as well as the most optimal subsequent motor learning is going to lie somewhere kind of in the convergence of all of these theories that I've mentioned in this video, at least in my mind. You know, each to me has a little bit of truth to it. You know, and, and I'm all in when it comes to allowing athletes the flexibility to experiment with alternative perceptual motor solutions to find the most optimal movement strategy that is going to end up being most fluid and, and they can really be authentic with because that's how I know that they're going to master and then become uh, a virtuous mover. And really the same goes for technical execution, respective kinematic structure of mechanics. However, for me, the often um, advocated hands-off approach of the coach or movement professional that the dynamic systems theory purists kind of advocate is something that I feel is already a major shortcoming in many sport domains. Thus, in my mind, that athlete is going to sometimes need outside direction for the most optimal discovery learning to occur to kind of augment this process. Furthermore, it should be noted that because uh, or just because dynamic systems theory uh, believers look to self-organization as kind of the main process that athletes will emerge the right motor solution with, that self-organization uh, should not be confused with the idea that some in our field hold true as self-optimization. You know, the two are not the same. Self-organization is something that I believe does happen because human beings are adaptable creatures. So it's going, the athlete is going to find a way to allow a motor solution to emerge from the problems they are presented with. But in my mind, self-optimization rather, so self-optimization could very rarely happen. And if it did actually happen as frequently as those individuals would say, we probably wouldn't run into the amount of problems that we do run into with non-contact injuries as well as athletes not being able to perform under chaotic pressure. You know, and, and truly guys and gals, all in all here, like the study of movement itself, the theories for the most optimal learning path towards movement development is going to be equally complex and comprehensive. Thus, there's no way really that a short video that I could post on here or a video that you're going to find anywhere could go as in-depth as needed in an explanation of what the dynamic sy dynamical systems theory is or really any other motor learning theory uh, or principle for that matter. However, I simply wanted to briefly introduce you all to the theory if you're unfamiliar with it as well as kind of give you my general basic take on where I stand with the concept and application of it right now because I believe it's definitely worth a topic that's um, it's definitely a topic that's worth investigating more if you're like me and you're obsessed with movement, you're obsessed with motor behavior, you're obsessed with motor control and motor learning and refuse to settle till you have as many answers as humanly possible to help your athletes master the movements required in their sports. And I know that if you're here at OptimizeMovement.com and Movement Mastery, you definitely fit that billing. So this was another movement lesson for Sean Mishka, Movement Mastery, and OptimizeMovement.com. I'll talk to you guys on the flip side. And until then, let's continue to master the art of optimizing movement.